Welcome back. I'm Pierre Daly, and this is Raise Your Average. Here with me today is my co-host, Mike Philbrick, a CEO at Resolve Asset Management Global, Jeffrey Sherman, Deputy CIO and Portfolio Manager at Double Line Capital is here. Jeffrey, welcome back. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming. And, uh, you know, raising your average, I took your advice last time. And as Mike and I were discussing at the onset, we're trying to raise my room rating average here, too. Oh, yeah. So, you know, um, so since the last time, I think I'm trying to do a little bit better. But we'll see. We'll see what the feedback is. Uh, I'm not convinced. So. You're crushing it. You got a big yeah. picture. You got orchids. It's the Shermanator in his room. <laughs> it's, you're going to get at least. I'm thinking you're going to get, I would say, at least into the high eights, low nines with that. Yeah. All right. That's all we can. That's all I can hope for. You know, that, that's at least yeah. a B, right? That, that's that's raising our average. So. Yeah, exactly. And, and and Room Raider, get on it. Tell us what yeah. it is. They're gonna, did you, they're gonna, uh, they're Jeffrey, did you take me. that? Did you take that photo? Is that a photo that you've taken? No, I went the uh, cheap route and, or maybe it's more expensive, route, but I bought it. So, uh, you know, that's right on. one of those things where I, I don't have that photographic eye. I'm not the artistic one. I'm I'm the other side of the brain. I can't remember which side it is, but way too analytical to get into art. You know. Well, now with the uh, with the uh, mid journey and uh, AIs, it is interesting that you can be quite technical in orientation and uh, pump out some pretty cool art. Yeah, I, I think I, I know what I like when I see it, you know, but I'm never the one that could create it, right? So, yeah. I'm not the one that goes in the art art museum and says, "Hey, I could have done that," because I always go, "There's no way in hell I would have ever came up with that." Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> I, I appreciate what I appreciate and. I guess that's what you're always told. That's what art is, right? So. Yep. Yeah. Well, you can you can use it to create unlimited, you know, NFTs and dilute the market. Yeah. Well, I did. Uh, someone <laughs> sent to me the other day that they've created a new mapping, a, like a tile mapping, which is non-repetitive, and so it's been this um, this math problem that they've been trying to solve for for many decades of trying to like have a non-repetitive tile mapping with only using one object. And they were able to finally do that. And so, uh, again, uh, not into uh, the topology and know all of that, but I thought that was pretty cool. And so I think that that will help AI create some new things as well. Well, Jeffrey, it's, uh, listen, it's great to see you again and uh, honored to have you on again and catch up with you. Yeah. We're, we're really stoked to have you back and for the chance to uh, to have this conversation with you. Yeah, Pierre, have um, you been brushing up on your California speak with stoked? I did, yeah. oh, that was deliberate. <laughs> <laughs> that was deliberate for you, for, for all of you in Santa Monica. <laughs> right, dude, we appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, uh, Jeffrey, it's been quite a quarter and, and definitely quite the year. What's new in uh, Double Line Land? <laughs> Well, I mean, um, you know, it's uh, the markets always throw you curveballs, so we're always trying to do that. But, you know, uh, again, uh, we've, we've continued to innovate. Uh, we have increased our footprint since the last time we talked in the ETF space. And so uh, we had, we had sub-advised three ETFs through the Spider brand with State Street. And last year we launched our first, uh, our own two new ETFs. And so uh, one on the equity side, one on the bond side. And uh, actually, last Friday, we launched two new ETFs as well. They'll list on the exchange tomorrow. So by the time this hits out in the system, uh, we'll actually have four ETFs up and running. So uh, we continue to innovate. Yeah, we continue to listen to the demand from our clientele um, and be able to deliver in the vehicle of choice that people are looking for. And we've heard a lot uh, over the years to the ETF wrapper. And so uh, we're happy to be able to provide our clients uh, some exposures to some different strategies now. Uh, these are two newer strategies that were launched in ETF wrapper. Well, con congratulations. I'm, I'm just curious, why would you want to do that? <laughs> well, you know, um, you know, they always say innovation is the lifeblood, right, of the business. But, um, you know, it's, it's things that we thought there was a hole in the marketplace for. And so uh, one of them will be a residential mortgage backed fund purely on that side, uh, focused on both agency and non agency. And so uh, we think from, you know, our expertise in that space, you know, uh, just focusing only on the agency side limits the, the scope of that. And so bringing our expertise there, we thought is something that, that's really kind of missing in the marketplace right now, having that flexibility to use both of those uh, sectors of the residential market and further expand it outside of just what's in the index. And then secondly, yeah. um, you know, the one that uh, made people would scratch their head and say is a little more controversial, but we're very, uh, we really much love the concept is something focused on commercial real estate. And so, you know, 
with all the headline risk and everything out there, it's created some really good opportunities there. Uh, but our team has ran very high quality, low interest rate sensitive or low duration uh, parts of the market in our low duration strategy. And just looking at that, that, there's, that isn't in the marketplace today. And so we think with our risk controlled approach, uh, the underwriting that our team does in the commercial real estate place, that this is something that's ripe for an opportunity set. And in today's market, it's one of the few asset classes, I would say, that is truly priced for a recession, priced for bad things to happen. And so if you know what you're doing in the space, and, and I have a lot of confidence in our real estate team there, uh, we think there's a great opportunity there. And so to bring that to an ETF wrapper, we're very excited about. And so, uh, as I said, you know, I think some folks would scratch their head. What are you doing? You're jumping right into the fire. But this is a part of the market that we think is extremely attractive. And so um, we have an evergreen solution for that. And so we're bringing that out as well. So uh, we're excited. You know, so the team is fired yeah. up, put money to work today. It's, it's, uh, it's very, very interesting. So it's good times. Awesome. Before we get started, I do want to introduce you just in case there are still some folks who don't know you. Jeffrey Sherman, Double Lines Deputy Chief Investment Officer, masterfully leads the Investment Management Subcommittee and shines as the lead portfolio manager for multi sector and derivatives based strategies. A key member of Double Lines Executive Management and Fixed Income Asset Allocation Committee, his influence is far reaching. You can catch him on the Sherman Show podcast, where he interviews top tier guests and shares Double Line's latest insights, named one of 10 fund managers to watch by a money management executive in 2018. Jeffrey Sherman's expertise is undeniable. Previously a senior vice president at Trust Company of the West, he honed his skills in fixed income and real asset portfolios. A devoted educator, Jeffrey taught statistics, mathematics, and quantitative methods for CFA level one candidates. Armed with a Bachelor of Science in Applied Mathematics and a Master of Science in Financial Engineering and a CFA charter, Jeffrey Sherman is a financial powerhouse. So please stand by and while you are, please like us, follow us, and above all, subscribe. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast are those of the individual guests and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of AdvisorAnalyst.com or of our guests. This broadcast is meant to be for informational purposes only. Nothing discussed in this broadcast is intended to be considered as advice. So Jeffrey, um, what the heck is going on in the bond market? We had SVB, Credit Suisse, the banking crisis. What's your take on all of that? Well, don't blame the bond market for that. Uh, you know, uh, we, we get blamed for a lot of things out there that uh, the bond market was crushing, uh, you know, financial markets last year. Uh, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to take any blame on the bond market for SVB, Credit Suisse or the likes. And so, you know, it, it's been a wild ride once again uh, in, in the rates market as well as in credit uh, in the first quarter. If you think about it, you know, we started the year with a big rally in rates, right? And January was one of the best Januarys on record uh, for the bond market out there. And a lot of it came from, we saw a materialization of economic slowdown at the very beginning of the month. And so, um, you know, looking back, you know, I think what the market was responding to, or at least rates were responding to in early January were two key reports. Um, and one of them was the ISM services data um, there was a big collapse in that data set. And this is something that, you know, when you get the, the contraction in ISM services, it typically puts you on alert. If you get it consistently, a contraction, it should put you uh, mired in some form of recession. And we saw this, that that was one of the few data prints that was the holdout late last year, where people are talking about a recession. If you think back in the first two quarters in 2022, there was all of this, uh, there was a contraction in GDP. The debate was out whether in recession or not. You know, I never really thought we were because the employment was strong, the retail consumer was there, and again, services was there. And so what you've seen was that you saw that collapse, but if you really look back in the data, the other data point that came in, which is a, a big shocker, was we had a contraction in retail sales in December. And you historically don't really see that. Really, December tends to be a positive month. Uh, there's the holiday spin, the likes. And you know, as you start to dig through it a little bit and you look back, you see the aberrations where there was, there was accelerated spending in October and November. 
And, you know, uh, again, one narrative that we kind of developed about that is, you know, potentially what happened is that people they experienced from 2021 during the holiday season where the supply chain issues weren't able to source things. So maybe people consumed a little bit earlier. But again, I, I try to get caught up in narratives, but really again, trying to really tease out what's going on in the data. But then by the time we got to February, all of a sudden there's the rebound in services, the, sp the spending comes back, retail sales are there again. Uh, yes, credit cards went up a little bit. We still continue to see some income growth. Uh, so all of a sudden the market's like, wait a second, potentially that December data was the aberration. It was not the harbinger of negativity. And so all of a sudden, you know, if you were chasing that market uh, in January, then you got whipsawed the next month and you got the reversal, you got the Fed talking about hiking more, up, upping their kind of dot plots and the like. And so, okay, now you're saying, okay, we're back on track. Um, you know, the Fed's kind of back in play. And then, Pierre, we got, we ended up getting the, the SVB uh, situation, right? You got Signature Bank as well, which a lot of people don't talk about, um, but that, that was in the middle of that as well. And so, all of a sudden, you had this fear of a banking crisis. And, you know, the banking crisis, I'm going to still call it a crisis because it is a crisis. And, you know, um, what we've seen thus far is a heavy response from the Fed. They provided liquidity, they provide facilities to help kind of stabilize that market. But it's a banking crisis and not it's not reminiscent of the financial crisis we saw in 08. And the difference here is the banks, now we haven't really distilled what's in their loan portfolios, right? What they've actually lent out into the market, but their asset portfolios are easily analyzable. And so unlike in 08, where we didn't know what the value of the subprime mortgages were, we didn't know what the CDOs were, we didn't know all the exposures there, they were at the larger banks, which are harder to distill. Uh, this is pretty obvious. I mean, uh, my boss said it recently is that, you know, all you got to do is hire an intern at the Fed. They can push the refresh on the Bloomberg spreadsheet to get the prices every day. They know what the value of that is. And so, um, you know, this was a crisis of confidence. Um, look, it, it was a it was a bad situation because, you know, SVB was connected to the VC industry. And there were so many, it was a well-connected area. Everybody knew everybody. And so it was one of those quintessential bank runs. And, you know, look, the value of these assets, it is depressed because of the Fed's interest rate policy. Rates are simply higher. But these assets are, are practically government guaranteed. And so it's a it's a mark-to-market -market issue, not an impairment of capital issue. And as investors, you know, there, there's a huge distinction there. And so you know, what we saw is, you know, really a reset of pricing once again. Um, rates are kind of muddling along at these levels again. We had, you know, some some overshooting a little bit to the downside. But what's what's amazing about this is that we stayed in this trading range, you know, still uh, throughout March, even with all of that, because we shot to the upper end of the range. And so I, I think right, right now, you know, what, what we're reading from the bond market is what are the implications of this? And so um, you know, we've seen equities rally, and we can talk about that in a bit. Um, we've seen a lot of this risk come back into the market, thinking, you know, implying, let's say, that things are all back on track and everything's rosy. And I'm a bit more cautious on that because, you know, the old saying is that there's not there's not ever only one cockroach, you know, out, out there, right? There's tends to be more. And I think that this is an endemic problem in some of this banking area. And so I, I think the ramifications are very profound here. And I think what this is going to do is lead to a credit contraction. And I can expand upon that more, but you gave me a very basic question. I, d I jumped <laughs> very deep in the weeds very quickly. So uh, let, let me pause there and, and see if there's anything else you want to talk about within that. Yeah, I, I, uh, I guess it's a little premature. I, I think I, you know, I would agree with you that it's premature to think that the, the banking crisis is resolved. Um, there's obviously a lot to uh, look forward to in terms of of the outlook at the banks, and you know one of those things is is the um, higher cost of deposits, right? Yeah. And and uh, margin compression, uh, you, you know, earnings compre uh, mar margins compression on bank earnings as they as they try to uh, meet with the demand from in, you know from their depositors. Yeah, and, people, well, I mean, and, that, and that has that has significant yeah. ramifications because it's not just the NIM, right? The net interest margin compression we're talking about. They've got to change their business model here, right? Th their yeah. business model was predicated on essentially not giving you interest, 
right? And okay, may, maybe they were you know sexy relative to the big banks, and you know they were giving you fifty basis points on your savings. But if you look at the big banks, a lot of them still today give you one basis point on a savings account. And what a lot of people have woke up and realized is, wait a second, I can I can open an account at Treasury Direct, right? You can buy T bills directly from the government set up an account with them they will put them in your account for you it does not take a level of sophistication and you can get five percent today right so wait a second i can get 500 times the earnings rate at the because you know the banks always sell as, as an x multiple of one another and so what you're seeing here is that uh, i i believe what it's done is it's woke up the population and all of a sudden people are realizing that wait a second the bank isn't paying me what interest rates are out there and so it's that cost of funding goes up. And so if you want to protect your deposit, if you want to protect your deposit base today, what you need to do is move that rate up meaningfully. It means you need to sell them CDs. You, CDs at least lock them up, right? Um, you know, some of them are FDIC insured and the like. So consult your tax advisor and all that stuff. Uh, but you know, at the end of the day, what that means is that if they're going to extend a loan out to somebody, it's got to cover their 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 funding rate, right? right. So it's not just margin compression. It's saying that the cost of credit needs to go up meaningfully. And why that's important, uh, well, first of all, you, you could say, okay, well, that's great, Jeff, but I look at you know investor-grade corporate bond spreads. I look at high yield spreads and they haven't moved meaningfully during this. Yes, they've moved up, but they haven't moved commensurate with that type of you know differential I'm talking about on deposit rates. But you know these are different corporations, right? They borrow in the bond market. They don't borrow from a local base. And so, you know, the, the thing about the regional banks is that they service something like almost half of all the small business loans in America. Well, you know, we always talk about small business being the backbone of America. And it is. If you want to look at where job creation is, um, this is where this is really where, it, where it's settled. And so um, what this means is that, you know, likely, you know, the funding, uh, the, the cost of loans is going to go up meaningfully. So what does this mean to your local restaurant? your local, you know, um, art stores, if we're talking about art, right, that may want to expand a little bit, you know, it's going to be extremely expensive now, and they're going to feel the effects of all these rake hikes that have been pent up into the system. And so uh, my concern is that this creates a credit contraction. One is that the cost is going to go up meaningfully. But secondly, um, what is the propensity for these banks to want to go out today and originate a long term loan? Right. I mean, maybe you want to do a six month financing, maybe that, but they're going to be nervous about their depositor base. And so uh, that's the thing that really is kind of unnerving about this is that I think there are knock on effects of all of this. And and those are things that haven't materialized yet. And we haven't seen. Well, I, I think they I think they may be actually materializing, because if you look at. So this is pretty classic, right? First, the Fed hikes rates. Next, you know, domestic banks tend to tighten their lending standards. We've seen a flight of cash out of those systems. Now, keep in mind, you go back to 2000, you got 3% at a bank and you got five or 6% on a T-bill or a, on a government bond. This gap has existed traditionally. The challenge is today, everyone is incredibly fintech savvy. And as you've pointed out, um, yeah. Jeff, you can go and easily get access to all of these places where you have a superior guarantee on large sums of money. In those one day. In you one day. In day right. right. And or those day. regional, like those regional banks have seen these, these funds flood out of their system. That leaves less money to lend. Yeah. Period. No, so, yeah. So now, and, that, and that's on that's on a backdrop of, of yeah, the uh, liquidity, the, the liquidity mismatch as well, further, right? That further tightening you, liquidity conditions then are leading to, we're already seeing this, that you see the, the, the loans and leases that are being created and provided have started to contract. And Powell did comment on that in his comments that I've got to have an eye on this because there is an impact that comes to the economy from this. So all of this kind of waterfalls, this is pretty much due course here. The funny thing is, I mean, with, with SVB, I'm wondering why they didn't just close their online bank like it's kind of a funny thing that they left it open you yeah. can just turn it off um you know which <laughs> yeah you can do that but you're probably not gonna be in business very long right maybe not well it would have paused for a moment it's interesting yeah. that the three banks that were allowed to fail have something in common silvergate signature and svb all 
Yeah, they all start with an S, right. And they also have lots of lending into high tech and um, uh, fintech type businesses, Signature and Silvergate, particularly crypto related. Yep. So it's, it's interesting that these three were allowed uh, to go through the failure process. Um, having said that, on that and, point, and the Eric, backdrop, the other the other backdrop, I just wanted to add to to what you both said was that is that you know the health to maturity uh, lo paper losses, unrealized losses on health to maturity assets is also putting a lot of pressure, as well, right? I mean, I mean, I think you know people don't people maybe don't realize that when they look at banks, the deposits are actually the liabilities, and the loans and the investments are the assets. Yeah. Right. And when and your they investments don't are on mark their the loans to market, they only mark the asset portfolio to market, which is well, another if it's interesting maturity, only on the AFS. Well, if it's no, held I'm talking about maturity. the loans yeah. that they yeah. make, they don't yeah. have to yeah. on the HTM unless they actually do one, they do all, which is all kind of weird and perverse. But it's, uh, it's backwards, right? It's the opposite of what people think. They, yeah. People think that, oh, SVB had $200 billion in assets or more. And, and, you know, that was ample liquidity, but it's not, it's a, that's ample liability. It's not ample liquidity. Right. Cause you have to meet the depositors request <laughs> if you do so, but coming back to, to Mike's point too, on, on these, uh, these three being very related, I think that's part of the reason you saw the run. You're talking about a tight knit community, one that uses, I don't know what technology, Reddit, whatever they use to chat these days where, you know, um, they get together and they know each other, right? Yeah. And this this is what kind of extended out to First Republic in my viewpoint as well. First Republic, you know, we in California think of it as a high quality bank, high touch service, the old school white shoe. They, they do a lot of lending, private customized stuff to wealthy people. And guess what? Wealthy people talk to each other, right? <laughs> That's what their circles together. And so some of that money went over there, then it left very quickly as well. And so I think what you're seeing here is it's it's like this psychological behavior. And, you know, it's someone saying, well, you know, if I think there's going to be a run on the bank, my computer, am I going to call you? I may, but after I move my money out and I'm going to tell you why I did it. Right. I'm going to get my money saved and I'm going to call yeah. you guys to tell you, man, you guys got to get your money out of there. Here's the problem at this bank. And so I think that that's the, the elements you saw. And I think, you know, some of it is why the FDIC stepped in. You know, they did create moral hazard here. If we're going to talk free markets and everything, you got to put on your big boy pants. You know, if you're going to do this stuff, if you're going to keep more than $250,000 at the bank, you got to make sure you have a sweep account, right? It, yeah. it doesn't cost anything. Like you can get a sweep account that sweeps into government money market, right? To protect yourself. And so I, I think people are going to learn more about the banking system in this so, and how this applies. But, you know, look, they did create moral hazard because yelling one day i mean during the press conference she's saying we're not going to guarantee it powell saying they're going to guarantee it they're just causing mixed signals because they don't want to guarantee it <laughs> but they also need to instill confidence right and so i mean when yellen was testifying i think it was the the congressman from like arkansas or, uh was asking or maybe it's oklahoma I, I can't recall but he's saying well if my banks fail in my region are you going to do that no 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 they're, they're not protected well if they fail they're protected and it's like so you create the moral hazard by doing that. And so, uh, you know, look, did we need to do it? I think it was probably the right thing to do to guarantee those deposits in the short term um, because you would have had a classic run. I think every bank would have experienced this with assets above 250 from any client. And so, uh, again, like th that's the thing. The market needs to work. Um, you got to play by the rules. But this is one of those where, you know, I think the Fed and the FDIC and Treasury they're flying by the seat of their pants here. They didn't want to have a banking failure in the middle of this. But Mike, lastly, to your point, the Fed hiking, contracting, tightening conditions, you know, that's the whole plan. They yeah. hike until something breaks. And I, th I think it's pretty yeah. fair to say they broke something last month. Um, they're trying to fix it with the tools they have, but they're also hiking rates still. They're removing liquidity via QT because they have to shrink their balance sheet and their viewpoint but they're pumping liquidity that offsets more than that in the market. So once they stop pumping that liquidity in, we go back to tighter conditions again, now with a tighter system as well. And so to us, this has put the recession watch, it's moved it up meaningfully. You know, this, this looks like we probably have a meaningful contraction at some point, you know, by summer to fall this year. And again, it's gonna, it's gonna rely on the response mechanism and what that catalyst is to get us out of that. And, you know, right now, I think 
you know, this is the plan of the Fed. They wanted to crush some of the housing market. We had it was on fire. You know, it was creating this speculative influx because of the wealth effect. And so all the stuff they did in the last cycle, people realized that it got on steroids this time because of the amount of stimulus. And now they're trying to fight inflation. And so, you know, look, at some point, you know, this stuff becomes deflationary, right? You just don't have the impulse. You don't have the credit impulse out there. And therefore, that means we're going to have a slowdown. And so, you know, I think the, the implications for investors right now is that don't get caught up in the panacea. This is not the time to exceed your risk taking. It's not the time to increase it. It's the time to reassess, look where you're at and make sure that you're comfortable with the amount of risk you have. And yeah. our point for the last, you know, even before this crisis in January was let's sell on strength. Things that are rallying, let's try to monetize some of this and let's try to build up a better defensive portfolio. And, you know, we've been doing that for the last six to eight months. And so when SBB came, you know, a lot of people want to interview us and ask, what are you doing? It's like, we haven't really made any meaningful moves here. Portfolio is fine. You know, we we bought duration coming into this year. Uh, we continue to extend out a little bit in January. And so we were comfortable with it. And, you know, look, you never want to make a knee jerk reaction here. And so, you know, we've been reassessing now that things look a little calmer. And the consensus around around the table as we have these discussions that look, we have a lot of banking analysts that really understand this stuff very well, way beyond the scope of what I do. And, you know, it's saying like, look, that this is a problem. Uh, and look, SVB had been written about for months, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So this All available for months before. Sort of yeah. like COVID well, almost. But, but then it was you, you, widely you, known for, for a time yeah. before it mattered. And then all of yeah, a sudden. Yeah, but this is a failure mattered. of the Fed. This is a oh, failure of the Fed. I think uh, we agree. Fed. I think, yeah. I think that, that's an agreement, a hard, hard agreement there. So what, what are the implications as we move on? So now we have tighter financial conditions. All of a sudden now you have um, the Saudis come out and say, hey, we're going to cut production. Yeah. Right. So now we've got another inflation push there. If yep. China's reopening domestically, so domestically, China's economy has reopened. Whether you look at China's stats or sort of look at airline stats in China to see how they're refiring up the, the internal domestic economy. At the same time, we still got pretty tight labor. We've got this urge to, you know, sort of have domestic energy independence. We want to near shore or duplicate or, you know, shore up supply chains so that we have a higher likelihood of them actually lasting rather than the, the cheap and cheerful just in time. It's no, no, we want resilient, redundant supply chain. Um, all of this does not paint a very good backdrop for with which the Fed will be able to make decisions. The, the previous 40 years prior to 2021 was easy. I mean, you, you cut, you were, you had this deflationary backdrop, inflation wasn't a concern. So I too am concerned about the equity side of the equation. The equities seem to be pricing in the immaculate reception, uh, recession, if you will. <laughs> uh, so what are your thoughts there? So we, we, we keep, being conservative, we, you know, how, how are people supposed to navigate this? What do you think are some of the shoes that could drop along the way? Yeah, yeah well, I then, mean, and then, and say, you, I, I thought about all this year was, you know, if you want to risk to this kind of inflation side, um, and it was predicated on the, on the China reopening, not really an OPEC thesis, was that you put some allocation to commodities, right? If we're going to have the reopening, if we get to the stage where you're going to get consumption back, and remember, this is a, a highly dependent economy and oil over there in china as well right if you're going to get the you know production uh, restocking it's good for industrial metals as well and so to me you know when people are saying what about the inflation tips and the like i'm like D don't look at the bond market for this right you look use the bond market for your deflation for your defense here but use a commodity allocation to do that and i think you know that's kind of what we're seeing right now and when i listen to you ramble off all of those metrics Mike, and, and don't take offense by rambling, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're just saying them uh, back to back. And so ultimately what I hear in there is that it sounds like there's a demand for commodities, right? And, you know, I, I think that's also could be one of the potentially saving graces. If you think about it, if the Chinese economy and, and the Chinese themselves respond like the rest of the world did post COVID, they're going to travel, right? They're going to consume the oil, they're going to jet fuel, but they're going to come to our country too. They're going to spend money here. So potentially that's a little bit of a saving grace here. But if I look at kind of, you know, you think about that small business side, 
they provide a lot of service jobs. And that's where you've seen the strength in the labor market. And so I, I know a lot of punditry will come out and say, well, those are lower paying jobs. It's not as good. Look at all the tech layoffs and look at the finance layoffs that we've seen out there. And I guess now we have uh, McDonald's announcing layoffs today, right? At the corporate headquarters. I always wonder how many people work at that corporate headquarters at McDonald's, you know, but um, it's supposedly a really cool facility outside of Chicago. But um, anyway, not to digress, but what you found, what, what, what I, I kind of look at in that service data is that this is the area that the jobs didn't come back yet. Right, because there was the uncertainty, there was the start, starting and, and restarting of the economy. There was opening. Is there a mass mandate? What do we do? And you know, the different parts of the country attacked it differently. And so, you know, the, I think there was some hesitancy, um, you know, for those jobs to come back. And look, I mean, I, I, I went to someone's wedding this weekend and stayed at a hotel, and it's like, if you want service, you have to request it. You know. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, okay, that's fine, but it's just like you can see here that the staffing is different. And so I think what we see in this resiliency is that it was a handoff to this other part of the market that was was slower to hire. And some of the tech jobs, they overhired and the like, because it was like, you know, this post COVID world forever. We're never going back to offices. We're never doing that. So uh, I think that you, you had this push and pull in the labor market that um, I'm concerned now because of what we talked about on the banking side and small businesses not having access to that capital to re-expand. And, you know, anecdotally, yeah. go to a restaurant. You, you, it's hard to get a reservation. It's hard to get in there. You get in there, the room's not filled, but they're at capacity, right? Yeah. And so yeah. I, I think that, you know, maybe this is a hiccup there. And that, that's why I'm a bit concerned because that's where you've seen the job growth as of late. So, you know, I think the commodities are the way to play this for the time being. Look, after seeing a 6% rise in oil, maybe, maybe just look to see maybe a not today. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe not today, but, but, but still. You know, what, you know what else is interesting, Jeff? You, you raise a really good point on, on the fact that, so when money leaves the regional banking sector, a lot of it went to, you know, systemically important banks. So now they've got a whole bunch of cash on their balance sheets. The challenge is they have no infrastructure to flow that back to loans in middle America to, to right. all those SM, SMEs, small, yeah. medium-sized enterprises, SMEs. Yeah. So in order to provide those loans, and this is what we're like, it's not like the cash disappeared. It, it wasn't like the 30s when 10,000 banks went under and everybody lost the money and the money was just gone. The money has been able to go to other instruments, whether they be those banks or to government guaranteed bonds. The challenge is there's no infrastructure for these banks to provide loans to these SMEs. And so we, we, we just keep, every time we go look for ways to channel finance back to the economy to get the growth to occur, we hit a wall, it seems. Well, think about it. During, during the pandemic, you know, the transmission mechanism when the free money programs came out, right? How did it go? It went to the banking system, yeah. right? And so that is a channel to get there. But you know, look, it had to go through the GSIBs, as you said, um, because they're the ones plugged in, they had access to that. And so, you know, to me, what, what you do here is that you just say, look, you know, we're gonna help these banks out for the time being, but also we're gonna tighten the screws. Regulation's coming, right? And so, mm -hmm. you know, some people say, well, got, they got lax in the last administration when they lax the, you know, the GSIB status or the route of regulation went from 50 billion deposits and they moved up to 250 billion. So it creates some consolidation, right? Banking's a scale business, right? You're not gonna do well in banks if, you, if you're on the corner just trying to lend money in the neighborhood, right? You've gotta get scale. And so um, ultimately, I think what comes in this is regulation. And what, what that also means, that comes back to my basic tenet. It's cost of capital. Because if you have a higher restriction of what you can lend out, what you do, uh, is you want to make sure you get the return on that capital. It's not as much of a scale as it is bringing that, you know, making sure you get, um, you know, again, to cover what they call the risk weighted capital charges or risk weighted asset charges. And so I think what you need to do is apply that down, um, you know, and look right now, you know, it's like JP Morgan gets hit with like the highest capital charge because the highest base, right? So there's got to be a way of having a sliding scale here. To, and I'm not saying to make it more competitive with the national banks or the GSIBs as they're called. Uh, I think it's government systemically important, important bank. banks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we love acronyms, so we have to use we those. Do, yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, but but ultimately, I think what what you'll see here is that it's just going to be a regulation. And there's a reason you haven't heard anything out of Mary Daly's mouth since this whole happened. Like 
that bank is under her control. She is the San Francisco president, president of San Francisco Fed. That is her job is regulating that system. And so, you know, she she's trying to stay out of the limelight right now until they can figure it out. And yeah, there's an investigation under it. And look, it's going to be lacks of oversight. And so I, I think what happens there is that you bring that, you allow that transmission still to work. And yeah, if you think about it, it's kind of like the perverse thing, right? Uh, First First Republic has run its bank. It loses 30, 40 billion in deposits. It shows the big banks. J.P. Morgan lends a syndicate to lend it back to them, right? It's like, we don't want your money, right? But we'll help you out. And then, you know, and what really made me nervous, uh, you know, a week or so ago was that when, you know, J.P. Morgan said, no, that 30 billion, we're going to invest it in there. And First Republic stock went down, right? To me, when I see something like that, it's like, the market's like, wait a second, why are you trying to do this? You're going to absorb them. And I don't think there's any desire to consolidate from the large banks to take any of these banks together. And so, you know, uh, I was talking to a few folks in New York. Uh, we were out there talking to some bankers do, doing what we do. And, you know, uh, one of the, the guys I was having dinner with was like, you know, look, if, if I'm in this middle scale bank, I merge with another kind of large middle scale, I get to GSIB status and I know I'm in better shape, right? And I'm like, yeah, but unless you know regulation's coming, that's not necessarily good for your business. And so, you know, uh, and look, then we then we create the, the problem that we don't have enough competition. And that's where the regionals really do good. They they yeah. do a they do a great job of that. Also, um, also as as we've talked about, they've got they've got the pipes to the SMEs, right? The small right? medium enterprises, they have the structure. You can't well you, you, you need a loan for your farm equipment business in Iowa. Right. You think and you, you think have a JP Morgan's doing you don't, it? You don't have like you don't have the traditional credit line. So Correct. you know you don't have tra- traditional yeah. income. You know that's where we saw it in the mortgage market, right? Where the, the all day loans because you know someone is self employed, right? And they're, they're not in that same system that works for the big banks, right? Because it's automated. It's a law of large numbers, and so it's the personal relationship, right? And you know it's it's integral to this country. We 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 have this large land mass. Hmm. Right? We're one, you know, that that we're spread out, and we have an economy that fires on different cylinders, and so it is extremely important there. And I think that's why you know it's also very important to save these banks. And I know it's been politicized. It's like, well, it's Silicon Valley Bank. Of course, it was wokeness that did all this. And everything. And give me a break. You know, we're talking about the financial aspects of it. And it's like it's going to be politicized. It's like, well, you save you know a democratic state bank, you know, because you're in charge. It's like there, there's bigger issues here, and so. I think when people realize that it does make some sense, but it's also like there's still bad actors in here. You know, like, I mean, look, they, they scaled up at the wrong time. They invested in what everybody else was buying at the time, and it's down in value. And they, did, they didn't have a chief risk officer. Well, if, <laughs> if they, they did, did, I, I they you didn't. know, first of all, I don't think for that person. Nine, for nine months, there was no chief risk officer for the previous nine months. Now, Jeff, I just want to pull on a string, Jeff. I, I just want to add one, one I, thought. Hold, hold on, Peter. Just, yeah. On the idea of, of allowing these banks to scale up and, and become sort of more oligopolistic, I kind of view that slightly differently. I think you want to have regulation that sort of makes the banking system a little bit more regional to attempt to have you know, some guardrails around having a fire. Like the, the one nice thing about Silicon Valley Bank was that it was tech oriented and yep. that area suffers the loss. But the, you know, the farm equipment guy in Iowa, maybe he's not suffering that loss if you've yep. got sort of a more regional type approach to banking. So I, I get, I wonder if actually making these things bigger and bigger actually helps us. It, it, I don't think it does. As, I, I don't think I, it does. It, it, yeah. I, and that's what I was saying. I was, I was kind of arguing with the guy that night and oh, you know, he works for a GC, he works for a GSIB. And he said that week they got $37 billion in deposits that week. And so yeah. you can guess, you know, which of the organizations he worked <laughs> at. But I, I would argue that, you know, at, at the end of this, it's like, no, that's what I was saying. I think what you need is the regulation needs to come down. Now, I was going to say, oh, regulation, you're not a free market capitalist and everything. But we need the regulation because notice what happened. None of the GSIBs had this problem, right? They also had their available for sale portfolio. They did what they needed to do in some of this. It's because they have a higher cost of capital through the risk-weighted asset charges and risk-weighted capital charges. And right. so that's where I'm saying you, you don't have to level the playing field, but that's you right. have to monitor it. Right. And that's where I say, you know, that, you know, JB Morgan doesn't want this business. They don't want to scale up, you know, on that side because they already have too much money today. 
right? They don't want it. That's why the deposit rates at basis point. They do not want your money. They do not want it today. Um, but I agree, we need access to this. That's why I say we have such a landmass. We have such a distinct economies across this country that you know people don't understand that business. Ask the Midwestern banker what's going on in Silicon Valley and that client, they'll say, well, they deserved it. They're crazy, they're gunslingers. And you know, you're saying, you wanna to lend to a farm, you wanna give them a million dollars in equipment loans and he makes $75,000 a year? Is that a good deal? You know, so they don't understand the business, right? And so there is there is some, um, you know, stuff that is very integral to that. So I'm actually agreeing with you, Mike. Gotcha. I was disagreeing with this person. I got you. I got confused. There. I'm going to be invited to dinner again yeah. now. now that you're <laughs> and sorry, Pierre, I didn't mean to cut you off because I wanted yeah, to circle I, that I, drain. I just wanted to ask about the, uh, the federal home loan bank advances. To, to what extent? I mean, it's less than obvious. It's not. It's not like the other two facilities, the 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 window and the you know BTFP, which are very sort of stigmatizing, very public means for the banks to shore up their books. But um, behind the scenes is this federal home loan bank advances that's happening. There's been some very large issuance the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, I think Alfonso Pecatiello pointed out that there was something like three hundred billion dollars mm -hmm. in advances. Is that a, is that a more sort of quiet way of of shoring things up that's going on, or or uh, is that off the mark? But that's what the FHLB is for. Uh, yeah. It's to help kind of bring stability to that and ensure deposits. And so essentially, you know, th that's kind of how the FDIC operates is through that mechanism, to yeah. my understanding. And so, um, you know, using that, I mean, look, you can buy FHLB bonds today, right? That's what you know right. they issue bonds to help that funding as well. And those spreads haven't blown out. Uh, you know, we looked at them because they're government guaranteed, right? So there's something to look at when there's a crisis like this. But you know, ultimately, the home loan bank is is there to provide that liquidity, and it's not the same kind of stringency that you see at parking money at the Fed, right? Certain asset types right. are eligible and the like. So you know, th this BTFP program, you know, I think you know, no one wants to use it today because if you're known, it's like during the financial crisis that. You know, when they rescued the bank, it's just they gave every bank money, right? Because they didn't want you to know who needed it the most. Yeah. Right. And some people are like, oh, well, we don't want it. It's like, no, you're taking it. Right. It's like and the so, firing squad. Yeah. It's like the uh, the old fashioned firing squad where where, you know, only one only one rifleman had the uh, the bullet. <laughs> right. 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 And everybody shoots the, you yeah. know, uh, to, to make yeah. sure that no one knows who did it. And, and then you don't have the guilt either. Right. Uh, right. But I, I would say that, you know, you know, I don't read too much into it. I view it all as one thing. At the end of the day, the one word that subs this up is liquidity. The bank didn't have liquidity. They needed it. The system was deficient in that. Instead of creating this fear, because once you hear about a bank going down, the next thing that happens is everyone starts to question, is my bank next? And should I go do go do this? And like, I still think it's, I won't say funny, but I, I, I find it very interesting in 2023, of people staying outside of a bank to try to get their money. Um, <laughs> you know, look, you, you could do it electronically. Like everything I heard from First Bank, First Republic clients was that they were able to wire money out instantly, right? There was no issue wiring that day and the like. So uh, it's like, you know, have you ever went to, to a bank and tried to get like, you know, five grand, 10 grand? They yeah, don't yeah. want to give it to you, right? Because you're always doing something unscrupulous if you're doing that. And so, you know, it's, it's just, it's fine. It's pretty interesting to me that, Anyone who's in line, the amount of cash they're going to get is under the FDIC limit, right? Do you think you're going to go in and walk out with a million dollars in cash? You know, it's just not going to happen. So uh, I just that's that's where I found it kind of, uh, yeah. you know, I'm like, uh, you know, that that's a fear mongering kind of concept, though, too. So I just don't read too much in the FHLB. I think it's all just liquidity. And the, the thing is, is short up to short confidence up. But now the next the next thing comes is like, how do those banks protect their deposits? And you know, we still seen an outflow of the banks from from what we get in the reporting. There was a new outflow of bank uh, of the re, of the small regional banks, and the the large banks got got more money in, right? And so you're seeing that transference happen. And you know, a lot of you are waking up. But did you guys see this announcement that there's a new um, VC or tech company that it's going to help people invest in treasury bills, right? They're going to help manage your liquidity. It was like a yeah, $20 yeah. million dollar valuation or raise on that. And they're like, 
I'm like, again, Treasury Direct, man. Like, look, I, I'm not <laughs> trying to compete with the Treasury here. We're actively managing bond strategies, right? I don't care if you want to buy T-bills. I've heard it from clients for last year. Like, I want to own this. And it's like, look, I don't have a problem with you doing that. Um, but when you own T-bills, you have reinvestment risk. When it matures, you have to do something. So you got to think about what that means for you. But ultimately, if your cash was earning basis points, you know, look, it's shame on you, right? For not yeah, knowing yeah. that. But also, that's part of our job. That's why we're doing this podcast, right? Is to try to make people aware of things out there and understand that the system only works for you if you know how to play in the system. And, you know, a lot of it is just understanding, you know, the tools you have available. And most people don't realize it, that you could go buy, you know, a government money market fund, or you can go buy T-bills direct, and they massively outstrip what you're getting paid to park cash somewhere. And you get, you get seduced by a CD. Like, you know, you see, I remember walking down Manhattan and seeing First Republic advertising a 2% CD. And I'm like, why would I lock money up for 12 months when I can buy the 12 month bill and it yields like 480 at the time, right? So anyway, uh, I think it's, um, I think a lot of it is just understanding this. And I, I just don't think we're done yet with seeing some of this movement of cash because people have woken up to it. Yeah, I think the, I think the, the other strange thing is that um, there's nothing wrong with the assets that we're talking about, right? That's the other thing. There's absolutely nothing wrong. They're doing exactly what was expected. If rates were going up, they were going down. Yeah. And, you want to and, fire sell those assets? You want to sell them at a distressed level? We've got a bid. Yeah. We've got a massive bid for that because they are money good. They have mark to market risk. They have duration risk, but they will mature at par. And you know, that's the thing you could not say during the financial crisis. And that's the distinction here is during the financial crisis, no one knew what those assets were worth, right? We all had guesses. We all, had, you have to run a model to figure out what it is because you own the credit risk. These are money good assets. They are insured by their, they're backed by the US government, right? And so that, that's the biggest thing about it. It's like, so, so, so I want to step in and buy it because you can buy these assets. Well, it's like, no, do I want the liability of owning a bank? No, I'll take your assets if you want to sell them below market, right? But yeah. I can go buy those assets in the market today from someone else at market price. So why am I incentivized to do that? By the way, I don't know your loan book, right? I don't understand that. And so unless they do, it's going to be very difficult for a sale. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm glad to see there's been some stability there. But I, I just I, I think we're going to get another dose of this at some point. I'm not saying we're going to have more failures. I think it's just going to be someone's going to lose a lot of deposits and something's going to have to happen. Yeah, absolutely. No, um, no, I, 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 sorry, I got, I got a question. Yeah. Uh, I want to change gears just for a moment as well, because I want to ask you about this rotation that's taken place in equities, because it seems to me like the, you know, the high duration stocks, technology, crypto have rallied massively in the last quarter. Yeah. And, um, so, and you know, I love it when I hear the uh, the crypto song, you know, happening, which is the you know the digital gold song, yep. and and you know, crypto C, we told you, you know, this is the problem. The you know, there's no there's no interference here from a central bank, and that's why people are flocking back to crypto and and risk you know risky high duration assets. Um, what's you know, what what are your thoughts on that rotation? Is that is that um, a mistake? Is it is it something that's fleeting, or you know, is there is there something real, some real fundamental action going on there? Yeah, I think if if you go back to academic research, it, it actually shows that you know a lot of like the technology isn't uh, interest rate sensitive area. We, we've cra crafted this narrative in the last cycle, and um, I think what it is is that growth was at a premium, right? When there's low growth, if you get growth, you'll pay a higher multiple for growth, and. You know, so does interest rates really influence that? You know, look, reference Cliff Asness, look at his take on it. He's way smarter than I am. He's written on value and growth forever. And it is a misconception. And I think this last rally to me feels like it's like, oh, rates are down. Of course, tech is up, right? You turn on the TV, you look at media, punditry, everyone says that, right? And so I think it's, it's kind of in the cycle. Like, yeah, of course, if rates go down, tech should go up. Well, if we have a VC problem, should tech go up? Right. I mean, yeah. I, 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 it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, you know, so well, it was the very, very big tech that's gone up. It's the five and names yeah. and yeah. they were yeah, they yeah. were beaten up a bit. And, you know, and 
I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I've got I got a bit of a thesis on that, but I want you guys to. Okay, I'll, and I'll let you. I, I'd love to hear it. I'd love to hear it too. Because like, is this short? Is this short lived? Is this? I, a short I feel lived? it is. I, I mean, look, the multiples expensive on those five names. They drove like yeah. the stock market again. They drove the Nasdaq 100. If you look at the equally weighted tech index, you know, a lot of people. I, 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 I was watching TV this morning. I don't know why I was watching CBC, but watching it, and you know, someone said on there, well, like you know, tech and all this. But if you look at the equally weighted S and P, I'm like, why don't you use the equally weighted tech basket? You know, you're talking about these five names. Like, there is something out there. You can look at it. And it's like, use that. Like, it's the same argument. But my point is, is that it's not this robust, deep rally. And so I feel like there's yeah, this the new breadth is awful, right? Yeah. Yeah, the breadth is awful. Um, you know, just like going to, you know, the garlic restaurant uh, over there in, in Melrose. I can't, I can't remember. The Stinking Rose, I think it's called, right? <laughs> Stinky breath. But um, point being is that, you know, the, I, I do think that, you know, in the psych, it's like, oh, rates are down. It's going to be supportive. This is what helped tech before. It's kind of baked out there right now in the psyche. And like, this is a whole different issue, you know? And so I'm not convinced that there, there's the sustainability in that. The crypto side is interesting because if you want to tell me it's the digital gold, right? Last time gold traded 2000, where was Bitcoin? It was, it was near the five, you know, the 50,000 handle or whatever. So I don't know. Your story doesn't kind of hold a lot of water there with me. Um, but you know what? Look, this is the crisis of confidence. If you think the banking system is failing, this is, again, crypto's moment to shine. And, you know, it's up. Okay, great. It's up on people putting money into it. But does it move anywhere? Right? And that's the thing. You know, in order to drive the price up, people have to buy more. Right? That, that's, how, that's how markets work. It's on a cash flowing asset. So, um, you know, again, you look at it. I, I just... I don't know what to make of it. I feel like looking at charts, crypto is best described by the by the Qs, the Nasdaq 100. You watch the Nasdaq, you watch you watch crypto. They they move in tandem, right? Maybe one's a little, maybe crypto's a little levered to that bet. It's essentially what the bet looks like to me. So um, putting those two things together, Pierre, I, I think that's kind of part of the crypto. And look, if this was digital gold, this is I want my money out of the system. We're all gonna buy it. It would be it would have done multiples of what it did yeah so on on the tech side there's a, there's a couple of things that that are kind of stirring around my brain one is one is when you when you contemplate inflation one of the best inflation hedges is to have something where the cost of production is very low and prices can be raised very easily which are subscription services subscription services in particular for software so these can provide some very interesting inflation hedges and layered on top of that, the one thing that's changed since November is chat GPT and AI. Today, uh, as we record this, the uh, 3rd of April is the 50th anniversary of the first cell phone call. Strangely enough, I came <laughs> across this. It took 16 years for the cell phone to reach a user base of 100 million people globally. It took ChatGPT two months. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the square of Moore's law. Mm -hmm. And it's funny that it's the five Who just majors. just passed away, by the way. Moore just oh, passed did he? away. Well, yeah, yeah. And, and so, so the, yeah. it, we just keep layering on the, mis the, mis the mystery here. So it, it just, it's the one thing that I kind of think it's overdone, just sort of like you. I'm like, yeah, it feels like, you know, but then I'm like, God, ChatGPT is revolutionary. AI, mid-journey, these places where you're able to increase your productivity almost exponentially as an individual, changing the landscape not only for the computer programmers, but for the creatives. If you haven't checked out, you know, mid-journey and whatnot, mm -hmm. I wonder if the market is anticipating the types of potential earnings flow that is going to come and it's going to accrue largely to those five like microsoft's building it into office it's in google everywhere it's it's pervasive and it's largely centered around that and then you look at the chips and the semiconductors well that's what's required you use high-end chips all of a sudden you see performance in that area too yeah, like nvidia is one of the best yeah, performance stocks in the world, right yeah correct yeah, because right. that their their graphics chips are what is used largely for you know this the, the data interpolation for the ai 
So I look at these two factors, one of inflation and, and you know, sort of this idea of, of low input, good cost flexibility, and then the explosion. I mean, we're over 100 million users in two months. That is mind blowing. And then how that might relate to, you know, the crypto world and the Internet of Things. Like we get a little bit into being a bit of a futurist here, sort of just thinking outside the box a little bit. But I got to look at the price and I got to look at crypto, Silver Bank, Silvergate out, Signature done, SVB gone. Those were the rails to the traditional finance system. And crypto seems unfettered. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I literally don't know here. I'm just sort of speculating in my mind about, wow, we've had some pretty interesting things launch. This whole AI, its impact, its efficacy. And I think there might be something there. That would be something that is, wasn't in the, wasn't in the, the, um, uh, the equilibrium sort of in 2021 and early part of 2022. So I just leave that as and a, it's you know, free. It's free. It's not like when the iPhone came along and well, I think chat GPT is 20 bucks a month. I, I pay for, you know, yeah, upgraded but, service, but you but can, you, 100 you can million get people jumping in and immediately. Yeah. Yeah, look, uh, I, I don't really know how to interpret the chat GBT thing and what it looks like to me. It's just, um, you know, it, it is the neural network we've been promised for 30 years, right? That it's going to learn on the yeah. fly, it's going to do it. And so, um, you know, look, it, it seems interesting. Um, you know, is it a fad or not? I, I don't know. And, you know, look, uh, maybe that that is part of it. And, you know, kudos to Microsoft and stuff for the subscription-based service because, who the hell wants to buy another disc or download the latest version? You force it on people, right? I mean, yeah. it was brilliant, yeah. you know? And so, um, you know, I, I think I think you're right. And, you know, especially with automatic payments, which by the way, still go to the financial system. Um, people <laughs> especially like the, be the, best, the best subscription is the annual because you forget about it. If it's the monthly yeah. and you look at your statement, you may miss that one charge too, but um, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting thesis, and um, I, I guess it's, we'll, it's, we'll it's, it's music, it's movies, it's all of that genre of, you know, like we have a music library. I don't know what movie is going to recreate some song from 20 yeah. years ago, and it's going to get hot again. And I'm just, I mean, I have songs now on 18 different formats in six different subscription services. I, I'm like, man, oh, man. <laughs> no, it, it's funny because, you know, and then when like a, a TV show or one of those, you know, uh, cultural phenomena hit and all of a sudden there's a song and it goes like viral. Right. Yeah. And there, there was one that recently, you know, I, I can't remember what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Kate, exactly. Kate Bush yeah. one with, with like uh, for 30 years, she would yeah, just thanks to Netflix, right? She's popular outside the U S right. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, it was on, um, I don't even know what show it was on, but it came out and then, you know, she's like a number one hit and it's like, wow, you know, the, that she was playing the long game, man. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> she was running yeah. up, running up that hill, running up that hill. Yeah, yeah. stranger yeah, yeah. things. That's long yeah, duration. Stranger things. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, fellas. Well, um, hey, I need to hop soon, so let's uh, let's take one more topic and let's beat it to death, and then uh, we'll call it a day. If what, that's good for you. What do you What do you think? What do you think of uh, just diving into how much exposure did you guys have to Credit Suisse and the AT ones? Because that was really unique. How they zeroed the sixteen billion in AT ones shored up the senior notes, gave the equity holders. I don't know if you want to dive into that a little bit, if you've got some talking yeah. points on that. Um, I'm yeah, happy I mean, not to if you don't, doesn't but... like me to say exactly how much we own, but I'll, I'll give you a hint. It rhymes with hero, um, you know, and so oh, nice. uh, <laughs> think about a number that rhymes with hero. Um, and look, we, we just, we never liked the risk, you know, I mean, they, they were bailing bonds. They weren't bailout mm -hmm. bonds. You were the one bailing people out. And Look, this is what they were meant for, is to help shore up the system when something bad happens. So um, we never liked the risk. We've been worried about Credit Suisse for a long time. There's a couple other banks in our list that we've been worried about for a long time. And, you know, look, our trading budgets have diminished with them. You know, we, we have risk management. We have counterparty risk committees. And their job is to analyze who we're trading with. And a, a lot of people don't appreciate that, you know, um, the, the work that goes into that, because... You think, hey, I do a trade. Well, it's done, right? We get in a price. You're getting it. We have settlement risk, right? Um, you know, we trade bank loans, right? Those sometimes don't settle for like seven to ten days. In that period, you own counterparty risk, even though you've traded a physical security. And so, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, 
You know, um, it's just important. And, you know, look, Credit Suisse didn't like us for a while as we were doing some of this because, you know, our we went down in their league tables massively. And, you know, we get calls and it's like, I don't know. I don't know what you're about. You got to prove the price, you know. And so uh, at the end of the day, I think, you know, it, it's it's looking at the, the stability of this. And, like, the European banks have been in shambles for a while. And, you know, we're trying to always figure out with, like, a Credit Suisse, like, can't even if the SMB steps in, can they? What are they going to do? Right. What, what are they going to back it with? You know, they lost all their gold, but they make chocolate. You know, I guess people still like watches, you know. Um, and so it's like, well, you know, and again, I always give the Swiss crap because it's so expensive to ever go there. I'm always like, how do you guys still survive here? Um, but, you know, ultimately, you know, a lot of people have, have like reckoned this to Deutsche Bank now. Deutsche Bank has been a concern with us off and on over the years. And, you know, the one thing about Deutsche Bank is, the Bundesbank is not letting them go down. They may nationalize no, no. it, they may do something, but like that's something that it's probably going to work. It's just like the U.S. system will bail out our American right. banks, you know. So it's a substantially larger economy backing that particular bank. One that than, one than, that has yeah. a lot of trade relations. There's a lot going yeah. on. They're not predicated on hiding money around the world. Again, sorry to the Swiss out there. Privacy, but, privacy. Yeah, privacy. privacy. And look, they they never recovered in the crisis and. At the, I, I still would argue that part of it was they tried to say, we're not going to deal with your U.S. Pirate, uh, privacy laws. And we said, come to America and you're going to jail. Right. <laughs> and we 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 seized on that. That really hurt the Swiss banking system. Right. The U.S. did drive and it was a long time coming. But some of it is because of, of what happened in that kind of, you know, mid mid 2010 era. Right. And so I, I think that, you know, Look, these banks are super complex. You know, we have GSIBs. They're, 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 no one understands every risk inside that bank. Uh, but you watch share price. You watch the CDS to protect the bonds, right? You know, the, the credit default swap market yep. on it. You look at the markets looking at it. And when you see something plummeting time in and time out, it's hard to get excited about wanting to do business with them if you can do business elsewhere. And look, as much as I've, you know, lauded First Republic as being this great bank, I don't want to do a transaction with them right now, right? Well, why yeah. would I, right? I have many other options. And so I, I think that's part of it. And, you know, look, the market can take you out of business, right? And, you know, that, that's part of what happened here. And I think, you know, their, their, their problems had nothing to do with the SVB issue. Credit Suisse have been spinning off arms of their business. They spun off the profitable stuff. They keep selling stuff in the market. And I think the market just finally said, look, if there's going to be a next year to drop, it's Credit Suisse in a big way and it punished them and that's why the SMB had to step in. So, um, you know, th that's not like, I don't think they're related, um, but you know, there, there is some kind of knock on effect there uh, just because we had this banking thing in the US. And, um, you know, so I, I think what it should do is alert your antenna it, or should raise your antenna. It should alert you a little bit to say, what are unintended risks that I'm taking? And, you know, it's not unidentifiable, but you know, what happens here? and to, to see that, you know, uh, my wife has an account like at, you know, she, she grew up in Texas, this small little like credit union there. They sent her a notice about they had no exposure to Silicon Valley Bank. I was like, they don't even know who it is. You know, like the person that wrote this letter is like, oh, we got to just tell all our clients we don't have any exposure. And it's so funny. It was like it was like during COVID, right? The, the, the barbershop gives you their COVID policy, you know, going and it's like, you know, what? I'm not concerned about the barbershop's COVID policy, right? So, um, you know, again, I don't think they're completely related. Yeah, there probably was something in there. But, you know, that, that bank was heading for trouble for a long time. Well, I, th I think they're related from a, from a global perspective of a very, a very quick and fast-paced uh, series of tightenings globally. Yeah. And yeah, so no, and the, the tide's rolling out and we're going to see some naked swimmers. Yeah, you know? and yeah. I've always liked that metaphor and... Uh, you know, I think that's what's happening here. And, you, and you're going to realize to these cycles is that, you know, who's actually managing risk. And when you don't have a CR, uh, a chief risk officer for a while, now you're thinking science. Like, you know, our, our company is completely profitable, but our CFO is resigning. You know, like, you know, like, look, the thing that kind of screwed First Republic is they put out a, a notice to their clients that we're fine, we're solvent, everything's good. I'm like, well, they're bankrupt by Monday. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> it's right? When you, doom, I mean, doom. right, it's the letter of doom. So, you know, look, I think what it is, is just, you know, make sure you, you understand as much as you can about what you, who you're doing business with, how you're doing it, understand the safeguards you can take, 
risk-free money should be in risk-free things, right? Um, you know, there's no free lunch, you know, you know, lending out your crypto, it's not risk-free, you know, all these things out there. And so, you know, I think that you're going to see that. But also, if we continue to see deposits flow and more money go into money market, that's money that's not going into the capital markets either, right? And so you exactly, can say it was exactly. cash on the sidelines. You're going to get some equity re analyst reports going to say, look at all the cash on the sidelines, all this money in government money market. Well, it was sitting at the bank anyway. It's rainy day funds. It's people using for savings. And I just think that that's another sucking sound out of the capital markets, which makes things tighter, right? And so ultimately, this is why, you know, I, I was pretty optimistic that, we could make it through the most this year and maybe stay off a recession. Maybe we skirt along a little bit. I never believe in the no landing scenario. I mean, eventually things run out of fuel, um, you know, that we, we will land at some point. And ultimately, it just feels like things get pulled forward. And is it soft? Is it hard? I don't know. Um, but I do know that it depends on our response mechanism to it. And if things play out as a typical cycle, we have some form of recession and all of a sudden, we need to throw stimulus at it. Well, then, then comes the next round of inflation, Mike, back to your point on the inflation side. So we may get a little disinflate. I noticed Jay didn't use anything about disinflation the last mm -hmm. one. And you mentioned something earlier that, that he addressed the credit contraction. I give him kudos for that because most people aren't gonna really understand that at the surface. And him going, I guess most people don't listen to Jay Powell like, like the rest of us do. Uh, but I, I do think he's trying to address these things. and so. That's why I think the Fed should be done with the rate policy. Let's just see what happens for a few months. Maybe that, you know, I don't think they need to cut at this point. And I don't think they do cut until something really bad happens. And they have to see it. They don't think what they're doing is working. And at that point, there's no like, we're going to take off 25 basis points this month. And in six weeks, we're going to do another 25. They're coming in 200, right? It's going to be, yeah. they're going to do something that has an impact. Yeah. And yeah. so, um, so, so slowly so, at first and then all of a sudden yeah yeah the old uh yeah. is that great gatsby or no no um it's uh it's it's hemingway uh, no no it's not anyway uh yeah, I, yeah. Slow, I slowly the and then all of a sudden yeah yeah it's 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 one of those classics out there too but yeah. anyway um so i just say that you know i think these are lessons to folks out there don't expect people to bail you out again is this a bailout it kind of is but you know look what it is, if we, it is a true bailout, the cost of FDIC insurance is going up, right? Which means regulations Definitely. going up. And look, I'm kind of for it. I'm, for, I'm, not, I'm not for the cost of FDIC going up, but I'm for the regulation here. It's like, look, if you by not doing it, we caused a problem, right? So there needs to be a level of scrutiny at this size and maybe a little bit smaller. But look, the local credit union that's got, you know, 10 million deposits, I don't know, let them figure out how they're going to lend in their little local community of 4,000 people, right? Um, but when you get to a certain scale, it has impact, right? And so I think that's that's probably going to be the post-mortem on this. And someone's got to take the blame on it, you know, at the Fed. And it's their responsibility. They they regulate the banking system. Great place to leave it, I guess. Yeah. Jeffrey, thank you so much. That was That was an amazing discussion. Thank you very much for your incredibly valuable time. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I looked it up. It is Hemingway um, on yeah. the if the sun <laughs> also rises. And so uh, if no, if, if our, your listeners have not read that great, great Hemingway book. Thank you. Love it. Oh, you want to just uh, where people can find you, Jeffrey? I'm sure <laughs> they can find you. Yeah. you. You just give them, give them the last bit there. And yeah, search everywhere for this painting and you'll find it. You know, this photograph <laughs> and you'll find me. Uh, no, but, um, the best, you know, obviously doubleline.com. Uh, we have our podcast out there, The Sherman Show. It's on all the major podcast providers. We have a Twitter account, at Sherman Show Pod. Uh, I'm trying to use it a little bit more to put up stuff just besides the podcast. It just, my time gets kind of sucked away in things. And with compliance, I think there's a little bit of time. But uh, that said, um, you know, reach out to us too. Uh, you want to be on the Sherman Show, you got a great guest, got a great recommendation. I'm always lobbying for, for new folks to come on there. So an email address, shermanshow at doubleline.com. So uh, thanks, uh, thanks for listening. Thanks, guys, for having me. It's a pleasure. It's great to see you again. And, uh, you know, best of luck as we start the second quarter here. <laughs>